under the big top in Guildford, the latest Canadian Army show gets away to a good start. Staged by a man who handled many big Wild West shows in Canada, Colonel Kit Carson, Rhythm Rodeo is a humdinger. Right from the opening parade, there is never a dull moment. comes to the winter scene and the skating routines, many Canucks in the audience get a touch of homesickness for the deep Dominion snows. Round and round goes the merry-go-round. The horses don't mind. They're not going any place anyhow. The grand finale of the show takes the form of a stagecoach holdup, six shooters and all. There must be gold in that dark taxi, and the wild redskins are going to get it or bite the dust. it looks bad for the forces of law and order, but of course there just has to be a happy end. Composed of and produced by Canadian service personnel, it looks like a long run for Rhythm Rodeo. In Hamilton, Ontario, the first civilian post-war aircraft off the production line is christened with fitting ceremony. Workers in the Cub Aircraft Limited plant have changed over to peacetime production. By the hundreds, the Airways taxis of tomorrow roll off the line. The first complete Cub plane to be turned out is selected for a special christening. It receives its name from Squadron Leader William Olinstead, the most decorated air officer in Hamilton. She is called Miss Winnipeg in honor of the Western City. Today, whether you are 16 or 60 and are capable of exercising normal judgment, you can solo with as little as eight hours of dual instruction. Just to prove it, Mrs. Oglesby makes ready for her first trip. Be careful, Mrs. Oglesby. Don't touch those controls. Uh-oh. Look out for a crash landing. Something has have to happen, but quick. Say, that's not bad flying for a 60-year-old lady who's never flown before. There must be some kind of a catch to this business. Yes, we were right. The old lady was just the chief test pilot in disguise. Meanwhile in Montreal, workhorses of war get a facial and complete overhaul to fit them for peacetime work. The Canadair aircraft plant are turning out remodeled DC-3s to fly the pathways of peace. In the war, the famous Dakotas were used for troop and supply transport, hospital ships, paratroop planes, etc. Now they are refitted for use on the Trans-Canada and other airlines. The first reconverted ship is inspected by Reconstruction Minister Howe and Trans-Canada Airlines President Symington. At one of the great shipbuilding yards, Port Glasgow, on the busy River Clyde, the newest Canadian ship is launched. The Beaver Glen, the turbo-electric merchantman of 10,000 tons, is the second of four Beaver boats being built in Scotland for the Canadian Pacific Railways. They will all be fast cargo boats. All five Beaver ships owned by the CPR were sunk in the war. In the Jarvis Bay engagement, the Beaverford fought a five-hour running battle before being sunk with all hands. Now her youngest successor is launched while a group of Canadian repats on leave in Glasgow wish her Godspeed.
Good luck and happy sailing to Canada's newest merchantman, the Beaver Glen. At Sherbrooke, Quebec, fur breeders hold a great mink exhibition. Fur coats on the hoof are inspected and judged for quality. The animals are extremely vicious and must be handled with care. The Quebec type black standard mink is a variety much in demand. White glacier and pastel types are admired by a future customer. The king and queen of Quebec mink are presented with the crown. They are truly a regal pair. Meanwhile in Brampton, Ontario, the sixth Ontario live fox show is underway. Specimens worth many thousands of dollars are on display. A prize example of a glacier blue fox will sure look mighty nice when draped on some lucky lady's shoulders. Before being groomed, a gag is placed in the fox's mouth. Its owner just doesn't take any chances. on display are the arctic blue and the platinum pearl worth a cool fifteen hundred dollars on the hook. The grand champ is an adult platinum, the tops in Canadian fur. The British ship Columbia Star docks in the port of Liverpool. Just in from British Columbia via the Panama Canal, she carries the largest shipment of shell eggs ever transported in one load. They're all for the people of Britain. So Ben Smith, the British Minister of Food, inspects the consignment of 34 million of BC's prize hen fruit as they're unloaded. treat for British breakfast tables is a great shipment which adds to the already great tonnage of food from Canada to the mother country. For the CAOF in Germany, the latest in automobile designs are on display. Hot off the RCME production line are some of the original super duper models of the pneumonia wagon, all ready for their personal appearance. Complete with everything but hot and cold running barmaids, who wants a Cadillac or a Packard when they can have the finest of general issues on wheels? No automobile designer can claim any patent on the new CAOF Jeep. It is completely new and original. The beauty of it all is that the latest improvements in the old hedgehopper don't cost a cent. They're all financed by the government. The elbow grease is provided by the drivers and fitters. Come one, come all to see the latest super colossal CAOF 1946 models on display. Arriving at Auric Airport, Germany, a transport plane brings the first of the German war criminals to be tried by a Canadian military court. Brigade Führer Kurt Meyer, an officer of the former Waffen SS, goes on trial in the Normandy building. Kept under close arrest, Meyer is allowed out of his cell only for brief periods of exercise. He is charged with ordering Canadian prisoners of war shot while in his custody. Major General Foster represents the Canadian Army and inspects the guard in front of the courthouse who are selected from the Royal Winnipeg Rifles. The judges take their place and the prisoner is brought in for the official opening of the trial. The court interpreter reads the charges against the prisoner at the bar, while the six judges wait to hear how he pleads. pleads not guilty to the charges as written, and the court is adjourned for a recess. As the trial comes to a close, Kurt Meyer is found guilty and sentenced to death 
as the first war criminal convicted by a Canadian court.